Okay, we're live this afternoon. After a few glitches in our Facebook connection, <laughs> we're finally here. Yeah. Um, I am so excited today to have not only the best nutritionist in the world, but my dear friend, Megan Dopp. And uh, I will introduce her in just a moment. But um, today we're going to talk about optimal nutrition for performance and gut health. And we've got some stories for you because both Megan and I have been through quite a bit in the gut health realm. Mm -hmm. And we both know the power of nutrition at overcoming these illnesses. Just a little background. If you haven't seen um, the other videos here on the live stream, you can watch all of them. Um, anytime you want, they're all recorded um, here on Facebook and then also on my YouTube channel. Um, you can watch, I think we have like 60 plus videos now. Just find my name, Jill Carnahan on YouTube and you can watch all of those for free. Lots of great content there. Um, if you want to find uh, my products, you can find them at uh, drjillhealth.com and all my blogs and articles about gut health and about optimal nutrition for performance, which is our topic today, um, can be found on my website, jillcarnahan.com. You can also find Megan um, there under Forbes Nutritional, either under Forbes Nutritional Consulting. I'll include all the links, so don't worry about that. Um, or on my website, jillcarnahan.com under services. You can find her either place. Um, so I don't have the formal bio, Megan, but I want to introduce you as a friend and a colleague um, and then ask about your story. So we met, I remember way back um, when I first moved to Boulder and started practicing out of Dr. Ra Roundtree's office and somehow you, you uh, came, you met me. I don't remember how you heard, of, heard about me, but came in and we had this great um, talk. I remember where I was sitting when I met you and we shared our stories of our health and our guts. And right. I was just I remember just like, I like this girl. She's awesome. <laughs> like really, really connecting and hearing your story and just your energy. And um, you've got such a wealth of knowledge um, that comes from your education and your functional medicine certified as well. Um, as a registered dietitian, which maybe you can tell the audience in a second, I, there really is a difference between your training. And there's a lot of online nutritional courses nowadays that are you know, go over a weekend and get a nutritional certification and you have the real thing, the real degree. Mm -hmm. So um, tell us first, just a little bit about what's a registered dietitian and what's your background training. And yeah, then yeah. Um, so, I mean, our training, I went to Colorado state and uh, the undergrad didactic program was, you know, a lot of science, a lot of chemistry, um, a lot of, uh, uh, kind of hard courses that I actually was hesitant to go into. I know a lot of people say that about doctors and I, I was always, um, I was always, wow, this is, you know, I'm not a big chemistry person, but, um, but you know, it was a lot of science and, um, and, and then, and so we had a four year undergrad um, didactic program. And then after that we go on and do um, one or two years in the field and um, we have to get a certain amount of hours working in all of our different rotations um, being, you know, the hospital and community and, um, you know, it's been a long time now, so I forget, but oh, yeah. I built my whole, my whole program actually in Boulder. I did a distance option. I um, went through University of Delaware because I was working for a dietitian here in Boulder, Nancy Grayson at the time who had her own practice. And I developed my own rotation um, prep, um, practical here in Boulder wow. with, with her and all the other dietitians. So I was able to stay and work and, and get hands-on experience very early on. And, um, and then I ended up working with her after I graduated and, um, actually that's, I'd actually bought her company and she moved away and, and I hope she's well because she was great. And so mm -hmm. it was a, a very, um, fast process, but it was also a lot of knowledge and it was, um, at that time it seemed like take a while, but it was very, uh, in depth and I, I learned a lot. And then I, focused a lot in the community realm because she was, you know, pra private practice. And so we worked in a cardiac clinic and then also in uh, a cancer clinic. And so, um, wow. moved on from there, but, um, yeah, that, that is, uh, that has been a good sort of ground groundwork, especially for, uh, what I've done. And now mm -hmm. I'm happy to move. I, I was happy to learn more about functional medicine, um, because I felt like that was, uh, a, a big help in my health. And so that was really good. Yeah, well, tell us a little because I remember sitting there talking to you and being like, oh my gosh, we have so much in common. Tell us a little right. bit about your story of your, uh, just a little bit about your own health journey because it always drives all of us and yeah. really allows us to seek the answers that we may not have found in conventional medicine. Right, right. Yeah, growing up, gosh, I mean, so I met you, I actually got office space in Dr. Roundtree's office and then 
we got to talking, you know, I, I looked over my shoulder, we're chatting. And then all of a sudden it was like, this is in common. This is in common. This is in common. And uh, like you said, I was like, who is this amazing person? <laughs> you know, like, how did this just happen? And I remember talking to my family, like, you'll never believe who I just met, you know? And so it was, it was just, like you said, I was totally a granted wish. Um, so it's been awesome. And, you know, so back to the, you know, my, my story, um, you know, I was, I grew up in Michigan and, uh, you know, on a lake and um, actually near a lot of nuclear plants, oddly enough, but I, I started to have some trouble with my GI about, oh gosh, when I was 10 and it, it got really severe, really fast. And the doctors were just trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. And it took them about a year and us going to to the children's hospital in Chicago to figure out what exactly it was. And so through colonoscopy, they figured out it was Crohn's and it was very severe. And so they started to, you know, try to do all the treatments, all the medicines, you know, Mm -hmm. all of those types of things. And unfortunately I actually wasn't responding to any of that. So I just, yeah, everybody, everyone's different in what they respond to. And I just didn't. So I, Um, I endured a lot. It was, you know, a lot of surgeries and just a lot of years of just trying to figure out what's going on. I was really young. So, and we lived in a small town. So back then it was kind of a a very obscure diagnosis. You know, what is this? We've never heard of it. And so, you know, we just um, did our best to listen to the doctors who of course said, you know, you know, diet has nothing to do with it. She needs to get calories. It's too and I severe. both heard that right after like yeah. literally same phrase, uh, diet has nothing to do with this, Jill. And it kind of changed my life. I know yours too. I'm like, wait, that, I, I don't know a lot. I was in medical school. Feel that I don't way. know a lot, but that does not make sense, right? No. So back to you. It just definitely doesn't feel that way. And so yeah, it over time and as I just felt like, you know, this can't be and and going to school, I knew I'd set want to do something in the health realm and and, you know, I, um, at that point I was a little bit more stable, but yeah, that was many surgeries and a lot of hospital time later. And, um, and so once we were, once I was in school, I thought, gosh, you know, now's my chance. Like, what can I learn to just better help myself? I know exercise has always helped me feel better. I know that, you know, I, I like emotional health definitely can play a role. I know that, staying hydrated. I knew these like kind of big, you know, broad things, but what else can I do? And so I, I talked to some professors and, um, and I, I really got some good insight from them actually. And it was very helpful. And I figured, you know, that food, man, food is really where I want to learn. And, and it was great because it was a great place to learn about that. And I, I was really happy to, you know, get, get somewhere with it. And, and through the years in my twenties, when I really was trying to grasp on to, you know, what's going on with my body and um, what can I do? The functional medicine piece came in like in my mid twenties. And, and that's when things really like, I was starting to get into triathlon and I was, you know, healthy enough to do these things at that point. And it was really great because then I could start to peel back the layers, you know, and, and not only was I still here and able to live life and and do these things that I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do, but now, now I can, I'm exceeding my expectations yeah. and these, you know, like the artichoke, I always say, my grandfather always used to say, oh, you peel the layers back of the artichoke and you get that great heart in the center, you know? And so it's really helpful to, to, I mean, it took years and years and years to un- unveil all of the medications and inflammation and understand and watch foods. And, uh, you know, as you probably have too, you go through these layers of of health that in different phases where you get better and better. So it's just been, you know, functional medicine. I just feel like I just, it has changed my life has changed my family's life. And I just, I'm so grateful. Oh, I love that story. And it's so parallel. Cause again, if you haven't heard me talk about Crohn's right after chemotherapy and both of us have these reasons, whether it was the exposures or um, gut permeability or um, dysbiosis, Let's transition just a little because you and I both know at the root of Crohn's and colitis and IBS, and those are very different diagnoses, so I'm not putting them into a bucket. We've got inflammatory bowel disease, which is what both Megan and I had um, years ago, decades ago now for both of us, um, Crohn's, both of us had Crohn's disease. Um, And then we have colitis, which is another version of an inflammatory bowel. And then we have IBS, which is just 
um, non-specific. But what I know as a functional doctor and what Megan knows as a functional nutritionist is there is almost always root cause underlying these conditions. So what we see is we see usually there is what we know about Crohn's is there's an abnormal microbial response to a normal microbial situation. So you can have overgrowth of normal microbes in your small bowel or fungal overgrowth, which are both very, very common. Um, and that for someone with the Crohn's genetics, like Megan and I basically triggers this auto-inflammatory reaction where the body starts to attack its own gut. So you have this autoimmune disease that attacks the gut lining and creates pain and bleeding and malabsorption. But the root thing from a functional medicine perspective is this overgrowth or abnormal, and it could be parasites, fungal, bacterial, there's lots of different versions of it. But I know both Megan and I, we found healing by like looking at that root thing and treating it. Um, so let's shift to nutrition though, because nutrition is core. Say you have abnormal overgrowth of bacteria or abnormal overgrowth of yeast. Megan, what have you found to be key in treating? Because I think sometimes the diet can treat both inflammatory bowel and IBS similarly, because the underlying root causes can be similar. I'll let you just talk a little bit about how does the nutrition play into this and what have you found in your decades of uh, treating patients and yourself? Yeah, I think that one of, you know, always trying to feed the person without feeding the bugs. I guess that's what I always come back to when I'm talking with patients is like, Hey, we want to make sure you're flourishing and we don't want to let them take any of this energy. So, um, the way to do that uh, is to try to get as many healthy fats into the diet. So, um, you know, the olive oil, the different types of coconut oil, um, you know, cooking with, with oils that are more stable at high heats, like avocado oil. Um, and then obviously the fish oils, EPA, um, EPA, DHA, um, like lots of good, healthy omega threes to help dampen down that inflammation. So fats really aren't going to feed the bacteria or the yeast. And so, but they also will give you, you know, twice as many calories per gram for the human. So as you're adjusting your diet, you're getting that nourishment. Um, when we look at those macronutrients, you know, the fats, the proteins, the carbohydrates, and you move on to the carbohydrates, then with those, you know, we're trying again to choose very specifically, because those are the ones that can really tend to feed the, the gut microbes and um, cause disruption. And so, you know, there's, for some people, it depends, like, as we know, there's about 5 million diets out there for different types of GI issues. And um, when we try to keep it simple, you know, usually the lower glycemic fruits are going to be a good option. Um, for some people, taking out grains is important. For some people, just doing some whole grain cooked um, gluten-free options like brown rice or quinoa can be a good option. Um, and then getting um, a, a more a lot of your carbohydrates from other vegetables are, is always a good option. Because vegetables, I always try to try to emphasize this, vegetables really have all the nutrients that we're looking for, but they don't have the calorie. So depending on the person, you really have to adjust, you know, do you need to add some other, you know, fats and things in there to make allow for enough nourishment or is that enough, you know, getting those nutrients are so key because of all the antioxidants and the phytonutrients and the, the thing, I mean, they're actually, they're medicine, you know, they tell ourselves how to perform. And so the vegetables are so key in our, um, in our recovery and our detox. And so a great way to feed the body without feeding the bugs and then the, the proteins too. So speaking of the detox, you know, trying to get lean proteins that are from good sources, you know, the, the grass fed, the free range, the organic. Um, cause again, we, I think a lot of people know now what those pesticides and what those growth hormones and things are doing to the gut and disrupting those, um, genetic markers and things. So I think that, um, choosing your proteins wisely and, um, getting them from good sources is really important as well. Yeah, gosh, I couldn't agree more because it's, um, you know, growing up in a farm, I, I, we had steak and potatoes, which isn't the, the worst thing in the world, but then you kind of go towards like really getting your, you know, grass fed beef or grass finished beef, which is sometimes hard to find your wild salmon and your, um, farm raised salmon. Those are actually totally two different food groups <laughs> in my book, a farm salmon is going to have PCBs and phthalates and issues with other chemicals and pesticides and 
Um, and it's actually one of your most toxic sources because it's higher fat and fat will absorb toxins. So if you're eating butter or lard or um, eggs or cheese or um, any animal product, you need to make sure that's from an organic source because otherwise it's going to actually absorb toxic load. And then wild salmon on the other hand is super healthy. So I always have people kind of shift towards that. And I found, I don't know about you, but a lot of my patients tend to already have low stomach acid or poor digestive capacity. And so they do better on the proteins like fish or chicken versus a huge amount of, of red meat. And again, it depends because I have no problem for most people with the clean types of red meat. In fact, a, a beef can have the same omega um, profile as fish, as long as it's fed right, right? It's what our food eats. Right. Um, any comments on like sources? And then sometimes the exotic meats like bison or elk or buffalo, are so good because they're less allergenic, right? Because a lot of our patients have like a beef allergy or, you know, mm -hmm. comments on proteins and your favorites or what do you recommend for patients? Um, yeah, I mean, I, we, our big fan is um, wild sea bass. I mean, we really, really love that, but it's so pricey. We kind of have to keep it at bay for too much, but um, I, and also Dover sole, wild Dover sole is a really small white fish and um, it's easy to, you know, put in a pan and cook qu quickly and things like that too. Uh, we, I, I love seafood. Unfortunately, we live in Colorado, so yeah, it's a little, bit, a little bit less appealing in the inner States in my opinion, but um yeah. And then again, it does become more individual, but my personal favorites. Yeah. I mean, I've always been more, I, I, I actually grew up, I really didn't like meat. I think it can be very chewy and I would re very much more prefer beans and lentils, but, um, but when done right. And you know, if uh, chicken, I do, I do like it pretty well now and, and getting, if you cook it right, then it gets, you know, then I do prefer to have um, a chicken or a turkey type of uh, meat versus a red meat, but um, but yeah, the, I, I really think getting variety and knowing, like you said, what you digest better and what's available in your area. I think that's another big one. Cause I know a lot of people that just, you know, you can get things shipped in, but you know, it just depends on what's in your area too. So, um, I, I do like bison a lot. Um, so I think that's another option, but yeah, yeah those are some of the favorites. Oh, perfect. Yeah. People, cause people love practical. Um, and let's talk a little bit about, well, first of all, I wanted to mention, so for most of my patients, you know, they been everywhere. A lot of them are already eating clean, but my, my cardinal rule for most people is gluten-free. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd love for you to talk just a little bit about gluten and why it's such a problem and why most people, even if they're not celiac or not gluten sensitive mm -hmm. may do better off gluten. And then mm -hmm. I typical dairy is also an issue for many people and sugar. So those are my top three. Uh, we can do food allergy testing and take them off those, you know, like more foods if needed. But what happens at a very basic level, many of you know this, you can have permeability in the gut and you leak these antigens across into the bloodstream and then they create this inflammatory response. So part of us helping to heal the patient is just temporarily taking out the big inflammatory foods, which could be almonds or soy or corn or sugar or wheat or whatever. Um, but what I find in general, people with gut issues, my patients with gut issues generally do better for the most part off gluten, dairy, sugar comments on food allergies and what do you see? And obviously that we can do more than that, like in a full elimination diet, but how do you approach that with patients? Yeah. I mean, I think you're right. You know, the, the, I always call them the big hitters, you know, like what's going to make the most impact without having to do a whole lot. Like not everybody's able to do a whole lot of tests and, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, go down a lot of different roads. And so I, I feel like, well, you know, I think you and I both get a lot of very motivated individuals who are kind of sick of them not feeling well. And so to, to say like, well, these three things can make the biggest impact on your gut health is, is really helpful. So I do think that the gluten, dairy, sugar um, are, are the three, I mean, sugar in, and gluten in my book are just, you know, it, the, for people who have the gene yeah. and, and some of the celiac markers, the gene markers, you know, then we know, okay, well, they're predisposed. And, you know, if they're having GI symptoms, then you can put the two together and make a good mm -hmm. um, protocol. But I think for most people, when they do have GI issues, yeah, the gluten, dairy, sugar, and then sometimes we'll even start depending on their symptoms, you know, are there FODMAP foods that are correlated? Are there, um, are, is digestion an issue? Is, are there other food sensitivities? And so knowing, okay, well, when they eat, do they get symptoms immediately or are they delayed? Some of those delayed um, um, symptoms are those food sensitivities that just build up to their threshold and then their body kind of has that reaction. So um, for a lot of my patients, yeah, we do the, we do gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, um, and then from there, 
where yeah. do, where do we land? You know, like, where do we get, do we need to look further? Do we need to do some testing? Do we need to see? But I think that's been such a great um, starting point because the test results um, for some of the, the food sensitivities take, take some time anyway. So we get that going right away. And uh, I think, you know, when, yeah, for with when people eat gluten who are sensitive, it's interesting because it's not always this um, immediate, like, oh, it's gluten, it's causing an issue. And I think that's what's so confusing is, mm -hmm. you know, these issues are this like long standing chronic inflammatory yeah. pattern, and your body is just ebbing and flowing with that chronic pattern, you know. And so, when what, what people don't understand is that. Um, you're not going to notice a difference until you're off of gluten, dairy, and sugar for a longer period of time. It, it most, for most people, it's not, oh, three days later, I'm totally good, you know? And so for most people, it's good to understand that it takes some time to really see those benefits because the leaky gut or gut impermeability, all that, that takes time to heal. It doesn't have, it doesn't, it, it didn't happen overnight and it's not just going to heal you. overnight. So I love that you said that expectation because really the half-life of these antibodies, say it's to corn or to wheat is three weeks, 21 days. So I always, I'm sure you do the same, like a 30 day elimination diet is kind of a standard because you have a little more than three weeks. And what we would do for those of you listening who want to try this, um, the top three gluten, dairy, sugar, 30 days off, see how you feel. And then after that, try to reintroduce them one at a time. Yeah, and you'll be shocked at maybe the brain fog or the joint pain or the skin um, turger, or there's things that will change when you add them back in. You're like, Oh my gosh, I had no idea that dairy or gluten or your stomach upset or loose stools. So often, often people don't realize, cause they have this, I always say it's like low grade static in the mm -hmm. background until they clear the channel and, uh, and reset, they don't realize how much food is affecting them. The right. longer version is the top seven, which is gluten, dairy, egg, soy, corn, sugar, alcohol. Now that's a harder one to sell, but that can be profound and it's free guys. Like you don't have to go do a test. You can go 30 days. Whole 30 has made it really popular. So if you want a program or a cookbook or, you know, right. whole 30 approved that has made the elimination diet really popular and you can yeah. do it on your own. Right. Um, let's talk just a little, you mentioned FODMAPs. Probably not everybody knows what that is. Can you tell us a little bit about what is FODMAPs and when would you use FODMAP, low FODMAP diet? Yeah, so FODMAPs are basically an acronym for the different types of uh, sugars that are fermentable. And so um, when people have uh, too much bacteria in their gut, and like you said earlier, they're not necessarily pathogenic bacteria, but it's just an overgrowth of bacteria. And, and these bacteria can you know, produce these byproducts that become very unpleasant and cause symptoms like gas, bloating, diarrhea, and uh, inflammation. So um, when, when people have that type of scenario, lowering the fermentability um, mm -hmm. it, with the foods that they're eating is very impactful so that then their symptoms resolve or at least get better. And uh, a lot of times, you know, we'll still need to do some treatment to kind of knock back that bacteria, but the foods themselves at least can get people with much less symptoms and can get them, you know, resuming their life at a better pace. And so what we try to do, the FODMAP diet is basically trying to avoid, um, there's actually, well, so, you know, Dr. Seebecker's, um, her platform, her, her protocol with the, um, she actually includes some of the specific carbohydrate diet into her FODMAP diet. So then you're actually excluding a lot of foods that trigger some of that fungal dysbiosis as well as well as the bacterial dysbiosis. The, so the two together become a really nice guide and a, a really nice platform to just go off of. And so this, uh, that's something I always ask people. So, you know, do you have issues with, you know, apples or yeah. fermented foods? Broccoli, or cauliflower, cabbage, apples. Yeah. These are all, so if you're like listening, you're like, yeah, every one of those foods give it, or garlic and onion. Those garlic are and onion is big, yeah. <laughs> And, and if, if the page is like, yeah, yeah, I avoid all those foods, you know, you're dealing with. So if you're listening, you're like onion, garlic, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, apple, pear, all kind of cause you to not feel yeah. so well, more gassy, bloated. You probably have SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And as Megan said, that's one of the treatments is you can literally do an elemental diet, which is no FODMAPs or a low FODMAP diet. And even without herbs or medication often get a really good response. Um, now again, Megan and I both often recommend herbs or, or meds with you know your doctor because those will really take it to the next level. But the diet can be pretty profound in treatment. 
Right. Right. And I think, you know, like, like you've said in the past, just how, how often that is, um, for the precursor to that sometimes is that fungal dysbiosis. Yeah. So the diet can be really helpful for fungal dysbiosis too. Yeah. So then you're kind of treating both as well at the yeah. same time. So, yeah. And you're not like, so like, cause antibiotics can have a place. I use them all the time appropriately, but if you are using antibiotics and there's fungal issues, of course you flare that. So like you and I know it's important to think about how we're doing. Well, let's shift in our last few minutes on performance, totally different topic. Cause you mm-hmm. treat a lot of athletes in Boulder, um, a lot of professional athletes. What have you found if someone wants to perform better, what are some of the diet tips you do for your athletic patients or your professional athletes? Right. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is, is first getting the, their basic foods ready, you know, like you're, you're eating balanced meals, you're getting good quality food, you're eating at specific intervals throughout the day. And then the other piece is that hydration and that, that actually is, is a very big part of the, the athlete protocol, because when you, when you're out there for many hours in the heat, especially in Colorado, when it's very dry, that when you get dehydrated, you know, your, your recovery just goes out the door. So um, some of the things that we try to do are getting a proper sports drink and getting a proper recovery. So I think sometimes people will say, well, you know, I don't want, I don't want um, to have too much carbohydrate or I don't want to have too much sugar. And I think that's, that's where it's because I work with a lot of athletes that also have GI issues. And so that's where we do have to come up with some other options and not necessarily take out all sugar because their performance, will, they will not get through a right. hundred mile bike ride, but, um, but we have to time things in a really specific manner. Nutrient timing becomes a very, very big part of what we do and knowing when to have the carbohydrates and when to have the recovery so that you're getting your muscles replenished right away um, makes a really big difference in their performance and their recovery. But then the rest of the day has to, I mean, if, especially if people are, you know, are struggling with any GI issues, it, the rest of the day really does need to be very clean and precise so that, you know, you're really getting the, um, you're really getting the nutrients, you're getting, you know, the proper proteins, fats, and those vegetables, because as you know, when you're exercising, there's so many health benefits from exercise, but abundance of exercise and, and any for that matter, it does produce free radicals. And, you know, we do need to combat that with antioxidants. So I know a lot of people might think, Hey, I'm, I'm doing all this, you know, bike riding or running or whatever, and I can eat whatever I want. And that's actually not true. Yes. Some people have a different genetic makeup and they are probably less um, vulnerable, but we definitely need to take that into account. Like if you're out there in the sun, getting sun exposure and burning free radicals and, and really hitting it hard, you know, you do need to watch your adrenals. You do need to get those healthy nutrients from fruits, vegetables, whole grains, healthy fats, all of that to really um, bring those antioxidants in and fight back those free radicals. So, um, you know, we do a lot with smoothies. We do a lot with whey protein, um, so that you're getting that recovered branch chain amino acids before and after, um, higher leucine for people who are vegetarian, because that's just such an important amino acid for muscle recovery. And that's not often in a lot of the vegetarian foods. Um, and, uh, and just really eating well, you know, and, and what, what's digestible, but also healthy, you know, cause sometimes that's the other piece of the puzzle, you know, you're heading out for a, a big, you know, brick, you know, a, a bike and then a run and, you know, what can we eat beforehand? Well, you know, like eggs and sauteed veggies into that, that aren't going to, you know, be a whole lot of roughage yeah. and then, you know, some berries and, you know, some honey and nut butter, you know, things that are very digestible, but also healthy, it's doable, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's something that, you know, I always like to take into account with athletes I work with. Oh, I love that. And so practical too. I remember back at the Boulder Boulder, um, I don't know how many years ago when I I ran and I was on kind of a low carb diet for my gut at that time. And I didn't do any juices or, or squeezy gels or anything. And I remember the last like half mile, I about passed out. I was so like my friend who was with me literally like carried me over the finish line. I'm like, I'm not, I'm going down. And I'm sure my blood sugar was like 40 or something. And I, you know, I just remember like, oh, that was very close. I, I felt like my, I was blacking out and they just yeah. grabbed me and like carried me over. But clearly I didn't know how to fuel. I was like, oh, I'll be fine. Yeah. But the, what, what I realized, and again, you know, this because you work every day 
it was like the practice I was fine, but the adrenaline of the real race totally used up more blood sugar, sugar, right? So that whole right. energy in the atmosphere and it was probably a longer day, like everything about it was more intense and yeah. I crashed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, the higher your heart rate, the yeah. more sugar you're burning, you know, the lower heart rate. So like for Ironman, a lot of times, I mean, unless you're a pro, which, you know, they can do crazy things, but a lot of times you're doing a lower heart rate. So then you're able to sustain more fats and some proteins and you can actually digest them for some people. And, and that way you are able to eat more real food. But then when you're doing a shorter Olympic distance race or a 10 K or whatever, your heart rate is much higher. You have, you're going to burn through those glycogen stores so fast. And so, yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, you know, a very individualized, you know, and uh, distance specific uh, I was a total amateur. <laughs> was, I, was, I learned. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's, that's, oh, fun, that's fun. Well, mm-hmm. what about, um, what kind of last tips would you leave for people as far as like, um, uh, we talked about performance, we talked about gut health. What's some, some of the most common questions that you get when people come in um, of any age or type or style? What are some of the most, or most common problems? That you yeah, the most common, um, yeah, I do. I, I do see a lot of, of people who do have GI issues and they, they are kind of all over the place. I do see, I think SIBO has been very common, I'd say in the last several years. I think that's probably one of the bigger things that is, you know, it's finally got a name and people yeah. can correlate their symptoms. And so they're like, Hey, I kind of maybe know where, what direction to go with this now. And so I think that's kind of one of the bigger things. Um, I, I think, um, you know a lot about this, but I mean, I think there's a lot of that histamine mast cell stuff that's presenting. And I think that's something that, you know, I, you have some really great, uh, um, podcasts and, um, Facebook lives on that. And, uh, and then other than that, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I think a lot of people are, are still looking for like the optimal health and, you know, they have, you know, three different conditions and what can I do just to optimize and how can I, how can I, um, you know, reduce the aging process and things like that too. Yeah. And you said something earlier and then we didn't really quantify it, but, um, so true. We think in the gym or all these things that we're doing are critical for our body mass and our health and our skin. I would say at least 80% is the food that we eat. Would you agree? Like some yeah. people don't realize how much, whether it's your body composition or the weight that you want to be, or, um, the optimal brain health and performance and energy. Uh, people mm-hmm. think it's the exercise exercise is huge, but I feel, I'm sure you do too. Any comments right. on how big of a deal the foods that we put in our body are. Right. Yeah. And in, in fact, I, I, when I, I used to work at lifetime fitness many yeah. years ago and they had a, they did a study and they actually posted it near our desk and it said base, I think it, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it said, you know, you're going to achieve your 15% of people achieve their um, weight goal with exercise, but 80% achieve it with food. Wow. It's wow. that much more impactful. And, you know, you put the two together and you're 95% there. So, yeah. You know, you can- wow. And that's exactly what I've seen, right? It's like, yeah. in fact, my own little weird history of, I used to be super high intensity running and all that. And I literally stopped exercising about two years ago. I not really, cause of course I do weights and but I like will walk and hike stuff that I didn't really consider real exercise before. <laughs> and I got in the best shape of my life because yeah. I was driving the cortisol. And for me in, in my early forties, that was one of the things that really made a big difference. So it's funny how it, yeah. the right exercise for the right person is so critical. Right. Too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Knowing your body for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any last, uh, tips or, or tricks or things that you'd like to share? Um, uh, talk about Gosh, yeah. I mean, I, I could go on on recipes. I haven't really done that, but I mean, there's, there's so many out there. No, like you said, with the whole 30 diet and all these other, you know, I, I actually, um, if you do grain free, there's a sweet laurel cookbook that came out with a savory one. So I think that could be helpful for people if they're having any issues in that regard. But I, I, um, I have a real passion for, for cooking. I just don't have the time as much as I used to. So I think, um, I think, you know, I'm always happy to, I have a lot of recipes at hand for, for my patients and clients. And I I think I'll start posting more up on my website, but, um, I think if, if people are struggling in the realm of, um, just finding ideas, you know, grabbing a magazine, checking the internet, you know, there's so much out there that, uh, just can inspire and get you motivated. So. Oh, that's tremendous. Yeah. We will share your website. We'd love for you to post. Cause you were always my go-to like, what's some good recipes, Megan, for this? <laughs> when it's like low histamine, 
low oxalate, low FODMAP, yeah. like how do we? Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> definitely. We've got, I've got them all. <laughs> awesome. So well, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to, like I said, I'll link your website and all your information below. Um, and thanks again for all your wonderful tips and tricks. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And thanks to everyone who, who came on the show as well. Thanks. Bye-bye.